All right, so this is our uh, lecture discussion of the respiratory system. Um, we talked about the cardiovascular system as its important job is to deliver oxygen in the blood to the tissues, but what loads the blood with oxygen and unloads it of carbon dioxide is the respiratory system. So the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system, two essential systems working together. And without either of them, that's one of the first things we assess in someone that's, you know, declining um, is to check cardiovascular and respiratory status. And which one is number one? Now, Daryl, you work in emergency services. What do we check first now? You know, we have the ABCs. Circulation. Circulation. That's the first thing we're checking. So even though they're breathing or might, you know, be getting oxygen, is it moving to the tissues is the most important. And what do we call that process by which the blood leaves the capillaries and enters the tissues? What's the, the clinical term that you're going to hear a lot that we're checking for? I wrote it on the board, tissue, the MAP, the mean arterial pressure is an indicator of that. 60 or higher is ideal, 70 is normal. Do you remember what that is? When we have good push into the capillary bed from the cardiovascular, from the arterial side of our vascularization, if it's pushing into the pushing that blood into the tissues, we call that tissue perfusion. Thank you. Tissue perfusion. So we're always looking for that. So that's where circulation comes in. We have to have good circulation to perfuse the tissues. And when we're saving someone's life doing simple CPR, for example, let's say you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table, someone drops out of their chair or starts to get cold and sweaty and then passes out on the couch, what are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do? Tell someone to call 911. Second, while the ambulance is coming, they're dying. What are you going to do? Number one, you, they need tissue perfusion. Think of that. That is number one. Circulation used to be ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Now it's circulation number one. What are you going to do for your that person that dropped over to make sure they're getting tissue perfusion? Compressions. Compressions, yeah. Good quality compressions are essential for saving their life. And do you have to be CPR certified to do compressions? No. All you have to do is make sure that chest goes down two inches and comes back up two inches. Because people get so excited, they're pushing down really well, but they're not letting it come up. Because when, when you release the chest, you're allowing that blood to come back to the heart. And some air goes into the lungs at the same time. So you don't even have to worry about the breathing as much anymore. It's quality of compressions that are saving lives out in the field. If we don't do those compressions and we all kind of stand around freaked out, that person is dying. So it's really important to do that and not be afraid to do it, even though you're not CPR certified. 30 times a minute, two inches down, two inches up, right between the nipples in the middle of the sternum, you know, and just straighten your arms, lean over them, and press 30 per minute, and you'll, you'll do wonders for their survival outcome. All right, so the respiratory system then. Um, is divided into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. We looked at that in lab, so hopefully you remember those structures. Um, okay, that's the problem here. Here we go. Okay, so some terms to remember when it talks when we talk about respiration. There's things happening at different levels within the body. When we talk about respiratory physiology, you need to know the difference, the, what's happening at each level. So first thing, we need to get the air into the body from the outside. So we have this atmospheric air um, with oxygen and carbon, well not carbon dioxide, with oxygen that we're, that's what we need. We're going to exhale carbon dioxide. So ventilation just refers to movement of air in and out of the body. Okay, and the lungs are obviously the organ where the air moves into. So movement of air in and out of the lungs. You've heard of people being on a ventilator. That's where they have a tube going down their trachea. It's connected to a machine and that machine is forcing air in and allowing it to come out. So that's artificial you know, ventilator. That's not something that people want to be on long term, obviously, because there's a lot of risk for infection and things like that. So ventilation is just moving of air in and out of the body. Then once we get that air into the body, then we talk about external respiration, where we're taking the gases in the blood or the alveoli, which are the little tiny air sacs in the lungs, moving it back and forth between the blood and the lungs. So movement of that, of the specific gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, between the lungs and the blood is called external respiration. Now, once we get that to the level of the blood, where does that blood have to go? 
with those gases to and from the from the tissues. So that's the next level, internal respiration. Internal respiration is movement of gases between the blood and the tissues. So that's deeper in the body, right? Because external respiration, we still have um, exposure to the outside air that gas does, right? Because it can leave the lungs and enter the outside. But once it's in the blood, it's in the body and it's going to exchange between the tissues then. And carbon dioxide levels are always highest in the tissues because we're breaking down glucose. Remember we talked about cellular respiration early in the semester? When we're taking glucose, breaking it down into pruvic acid, running through the Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, making ATP. And one of the waste products of that whole process is carbon dioxide and water. So carbon dioxide is always highest in the tissue, so it's going to diffuse from the tissues to the blood. And our outside air is obviously always highest in oxygen, but once it gets into the lungs, in the body, the lungs, the alveoli, has the highest concentration of oxygen. And you're going to need to know those two things. That will definitely be on the test in some shape or form. Where is oxygen concentration the highest in the body? What did I just tell you? In the alveoli of the lungs. And where is CO2 always highest in the body? In the tissues. So we're always going to see diffusion from the tissues to the blood for carbon dioxide because it's always highest in the tissues. And we're always going to see diffusion from the alveoli to the blood because that's where it's highest. So oxygen will always diffuse from the alveoli to the blood. <coughs> so be aware, you know, where the different levels of respiration are occurring. Internal is between blood and tissues. External is between lungs and blood. And ventilation is between the outside air and the lungs. Cellular respiration is what we talked about earlier, and that's just the process of breaking down glucose to make ATP. So that's a separate topic. Don't confuse that. Okay, so functions of the respiratory system then. Gas exchange is number one. We're exhaling carbon dioxide. We're bringing in oxygen. And anything that interferes with that is going to create problems. We're not getting enough oxygen. We're going to, our central nervous system is going to shut down. We're not producing ATP. All systems are going to slow down because we have no fuel. And if that happens for too long, we'll die very quickly. So, and the oxygen has very high brain, or very high oxygen needs. The, the brain has very high oxygen needs. So if we don't get oxygen, first thing that's going to happen, we're going to pass out, right? Or become very groggy and, um, and then pass out. And... Um, carbon dioxide, if that builds up in the blood, our blood becomes acidic. And one thing I want you to remember, take home phrase from general A&P and advanced A&P, I teach all my students, is CO2 makes acid. Just remember that, CO2 makes acid in the body. So if someone is not blowing off their carbon dioxide, they're becoming acidic. Their blood is becoming acidic. And we're going to talk about that, some pathophysiology related to people that can't blow off CO2. So CO2 makes acid. All right, regulating blood pH. So by changing our carbon dioxide levels, we can regulate our acidity in our blood. For example, if CO2 is building up in the body, we're becoming acidic. If we don't have enough CO2, we can be going the other direction, <coughs> alkaline, right? pH is rising in the blood. That's not good either. What is a normal blood pH, do you remember? 7.35 to... <coughs> 7.45, and you'll need to know that for this system as well. Normal blood pH, 7.35 to 7.45. So we can regulate the amount of, and there's other buffers in the body that regulate that pH, but when we talk about the respiratory system, it's the CO2 levels. So if someone is hyperventilating, <laughs> breathing really fast, they're actually not blowing off CO2, and they need more CO2. I'm sorry, they're blowing off too much CO2, so they need CO2. So their blood is becoming basic, pH is going up. So what do we tell people to do when they're hyperventilating? Anybody ever play sports and people get all excited and over, you know, overly exhausted and they start to hyperventilate? What does the coach tell you to do? Expand the lungs. Raising the arms will help for sure. But to change those CO2 levels? Yeah. Breathe in a, a brown paper bag or a plastic bag, whatever, and that'll allow to trap more CO2 and bring it back into your body, and that'll lower the blood pH. That's one thing we can do. <coughs> Voice production, we have vocal cords that stretch across our larynx, and as, as air f blows past them, that vibrates those vocal cords and allows us to produce sound. 
olfaction, we learned with the special senses, that's smell. So when we bring air in through our nasal cavity, those chemicals, those molecules suspended in the air, dissolve in the mucous membrane and allow us to detect different odors. And it protects us against infection. We have cilia. Three things protect us. Cilia in our airways, our upper airways, little tiny hair-like structures that, that move, that trap. The mucus is the second thing. The mucus traps the um, suspended particles, and the cilia beats it toward the digestive tract. And then we have macrophages. When you study the immune system in your independent assignment, macrophages um, act as little Pac-Men. They are phagocytes, which um, attack cellular debris and foreign particles. And every time we exhale, we're exhaling millions of dead macrophages into the air. Good thing we don't have microscopic vision, right? So we our respiratory tract is divided into upper and lower sections. So when you have an upper respiratory infection, um, those examples of that are like sinus infections, um, allergies, allergic rhinitis, we call that if you have a runny nose. Um, just the common cold commonly is in the upper airways. Even though you can get a little cough with that, it's still in the upper airways because the doctor, maybe you'll go into the doctor and say, I've got this terrible cough, I just feel terrible, I think I have pneumonia or bronchitis. And the doctor will listen to your lungs. And if those lungs are clear, then he'll say, no, your lungs are fine. You, know, you just have an upper respiratory infection. And you can be really sick with those. It's not underestimating that those don't make you feel miserable. But the good news is it's not in your lungs, and it's less likely that it's going to be something long-term, that you just need to kind of work through it. So upper respiratory infections are very common. And in kids, you know, that when we get all that mucus buildup in those upper airways, especially in the nasal cavity, we have that eustachian tube in the back of the nasopharynx that leads right up to the middle ear where there's no access to the outside, and that's where those kids get um, ear infections when they have an upper respiratory infection. So if you know kids or you have kids that are prone to those, just watch after a cold. A cold that hangs on for a month in a little child with constant runny nose, that's probably a sign of an ear infection. Kids shouldn't have a runny nose for a month from a cold. Colds usually run about one to two weeks in little kids, and then they should go away. So if they don't and the child's up crying in the middle of the night, that's a sign of increased pressure in the middle ear because of an ear infection, and they should be seen. Article in the paper today just talked about how we're overprescribing antibiotics for upper respiratory infections because most of them are caused by viruses, and people want a quick fix, so they go into the doctor and they pressure the doctor to give their kids an antibiotic. And <clears throat> unless that middle ear is infected and really infected, they're not going to prescribe antibiotics because it's creating superbugs. When we keep you know, killing these minor bugs, then they mutate to resist those antibiotics, and now we've got superbugs of which we have no antibiotic to treat it with. So we want to try to keep our current bugs that are floating around our population, we want to keep them susceptible to our antibiotics. But if we keep prescribing antibiotics, they're not going to be susceptible anymore, and they're going to mutate to the next level. And the um, number of new antibiotics being created is very small. There's not a lot of money in antibiotics. Antibiotics are cheap. So people don't, research labs aren't going into that. They'd like to find, you know, new drugs for blood pressure, blood thinners, because there's a lot of money in that. Those people need to take those. Because how often do you take antibiotics? Oh, how long do we take antibiotics for, typically? Seven to ten days, yeah. And then you're done, right? That's it for the year, hopefully, if you're a healthy person. But what if you have blood, high blood pressure? How often do you take your blood pressure medication? every day, sometimes twice a day. There's a lot of money to be made in people who develop blood pressure medications. So we put a lot of money in those everyday medications. You know, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical companies and less money in antibiotics. So it's something we really um, are setting us up for, you know, a disaster if we get a superbug that hits the general population. All right, so we'll talk about each of the divisions and just what their function is related to the respiratory system. So the nose, its job is to bring air in to help our inhalation. And you'll know, you know, if we have a really stuffy nose, it, feel like, it feels like it's hard to breathe, doesn't it, when you don't have that extra help from the nasal cavity? So it definitely is a passageway, extra passageway for air to come in. And what lines the nose is a mucous membrane with cilia. So the cilia will trap the, the debris in the air. And the um, mucus that is produced by that membrane um, has a high water content, so that humidifies the air. So when it hits your lungs, it's not dry air. It's moistened air, which is easier on the lungs, on that simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli. And we have capillaries right at the surface in our, in our nose that helps warm that air as it comes in. 
And what happens nowadays with this really cold weather, your cilia, when it's really cold out, like, you know, maybe not in the 20s, but when you get down to the zero to four, when your nose just drips and you can't do a darn thing about it, that's because in the cold temperatures, the cilia are paralyzed. And when that cold air hits your warm nasal cavity, the moisture in the air conden or in your nose condenses and causes your nose to drip. So it essentially is, you know, water that's dripping out of your nose. It's not, um, you know, mucus, maybe a little bit of mucus if you have, you know, some in your nose from a cold or whatever, but it's mostly just water that's dripping out. You can't do anything about it. Um, and some people are tend um, towards nosebleeds because of a lot of capillaries right at the surface, so a little bump in the nose and their nose is bleeding. That's not uncommon. It doesn't mean anything bad. It just means they have a dense network of capillaries at the surface. And especially in kids, we see that, that they tend towards nosebleeds more than adults do. It's not a not a big deal. The best thing you can do, though, is just pinch the nose to compress those capillaries to promote clotting and tilt the head forward. If you tilt it back, some people are sensitive to that blood in the stomach. It can cause nausea and vomiting. So um, it's best to just lean forward, pinch the nose tight, and, um, and sometimes even pinching between the eyes, you know, the, the vessels leading to the nose um, are on either side of the, of the bridge of the nose between the eyes. Sometimes that helps as well. But just pinching the two sides of the nostrils together will help that. Talked about sense of smell already. Um, remember the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone had the little tiny holes in it. Those are the olfactory nerves that reach up, go up to the brain from the nasal cavity. And then we had the sinuses. We studied that in the skeletal system, that normally those um, are good spaces. They're filled with air. They lighten the weight of the skull. And when they get infected with a cold that's gone bad and they're thick with mucus and fluid, they don't resonate very well. And you can tell when someone has a sinus infection because they have that kind of um, solid sounding um, aspect to their voice. Or if you have a really runny nose cold, they sound extra resonating. You can tell over the phone when you're talking to a relative that has a really runny nose versus a really plug nose. And then the pharynx is a common passageway for both air and food. And in lab, you had to learn the different regions of the pharynx, starting with the nasopharynx. Remember, we had the adenoids located there. That's at the top of the pharynx. And then the oropharynx had the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils. And then the laryngopharynx, remember, that's um, the top of that is the epiglottis. And that goes down to where the esophagus and the trachea divide. So that's a, just another name for the throat. So when someone comes into the doctor and says, I have a sore throat, they're going to write down in the clinic notes, um, pharyngitis. And most causes of sore throat are viral in nature, unless you're someone who commonly gets strep infections. Then, you know, then it's strep throat, and they'll do a strep test, and you will need antibiotics to, to clear that infection. But most cases of strep throat, in the, or of pharyngitis in the general population are viral. So looking at the larynx then, we looked at this in lab also. Remember that the epiglottis is what protects food from going into the airway. So that's a flap of cartilage that covers the larynx when you swallow. Otherwise, we have these C-shaped cartilages that keep the airways open and the large cartilages of the, of the larynx. This large one here, the thyroid cartilage, um, can be prominent in men because with testosterone that stimulates cartilage growth, especially during puberty, you can see a real prominent Adam's apple in some men, especially if they're tall and thin. And also that deepens the voice. So when people have a larger airway, they have a larger voice. Or larger voice, lower voice. 